One of the other biases I'll throw into the mix here is uh, it's called the Parmenides fallacy. And I don't know if you've ever run across this, but there was this Greek guy who I presume was called Parmenides, um, who, who said, you know, when we're making decisions about how to make investments, and of course that's on everybody's mind right now, you know, cash is going to be scarce and what do we spend our time and money on? Um, and he said, what people will do, a bias, is we compare state A, which is where we are today, with state B, which is what we're looking at tomorrow. And very often we find state A to be much more preferable. Uh, and so we don't make the investment because state B compared to state A doesn't look good. The right comparison is state, not state A to B, it's state B to C if we do nothing. Mm. And the fallacy is we compare a future to a, a, a present that we think we know, rather than let's look at where the future could be if we do nothing or if we make other kinds of choices. And so it's that future to future comparison we really need to be thinking about. And I think it's just a, such a clear way of, of, of describing it, because as you said, a lot of people right now are kind of, but, but, but I liked the growth economy and I liked coming into work and I liked, you know, not having my kids underfoot and I like, and you know, we're already starting to see, I mean, I, I, I find this astonishing, but protest movements about people saying, you know, we've been home long enough and all the scientists are going, no, 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 <laughs> you know, don't do that. But, um, but I think it's, it's kind of fascinating that, um, that, 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 that sort of ability to uh, overlook, you know, valid scientific information is just quite interesting to me. Mm -hmm. so, yep. So, um, so out of all this chaos, um, you've talked about geopolitical chaos, the financial plunge, but that this also is going to create some opportunities. So, you know, prediction's impossible, I know that, but what might some things happen that, you know, I think you've called it the Great Reset, you know, yeah. some things that might be different as we think about the future. Well, the great, I mean, the, great, the spirit of the Great uh, Reset was really is a, is a series of three pieces. One is about what just happened and how to think about that. And then secondly, is as, a, as an outside force. So then the second one we're just publishing this week is called The New Now and the New Future, which is, okay, what does that mean for me and my company? Mm -hmm. And the third one, which we're writing, uh, will come out next week, is called The Refounder, is, which is, what's, what's my job now? Like, what's my job in the leadership team? Yeah. And um, it's really a framework to think about large force, force as a team, force as an individual. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in this moment, uh, there's just, the world is awash in recommendations and leadership and stuff right now. The noise in the space of like, you know, how to lead, how to do, everybody's all over this. And yeah. the spirit of what we did it was actually, and said it was really much more vulnerable because, um, you know, as a startup founder with a small company, like that struggle of, of those questions is one I'm, we're just asking for ourselves, asking as an individual, as a founder and CEO, and um, just putting it out there of a way to think, not, a, not, a, not to tell, but to share um, what that journey is like, uh -huh. largely for the team uh, when you're is, is to separate um, for the past, which is the acceptance part. The reset mm -hmm. is about letting that go to your points around the behavioral psychology and recognizing those. But then it's the work, right? And I, th I think there's a, there's two things that have to happen simultaneously. One is to create a new now, which is to reset the metrics, reset the goals, uh, all the expectations around really uniting the team in its resolve in this moment about what is the work to do to with what we have now? And that also means so good for me. It's also resetting expectations, which is you know, we got to be solving acute to broad needs in the world as we move through this. And the third element of the new now is just how do we rebalance and rescale into the reality? So that new now really frames the what do I need to do with what I have? But at the same time, I have to be asked the question, OK, well, all the needs in the world that I was selling to just changed in large, a large way. Um, and so I have to create a new future. I have to go after and discover the needs in the world, whether my channel was blown up or, you know, in some instances, how I serviced my space in, uh, before is now radically changed. So I have to innovate. I have to reactivate growth. And the last part of the new future, not only innovation, is just I got to reform my systems. I, my system adaptability, capability, and culture that learning velocity and its ability to really unlearn as a key indicator of success versus learning is what's central to this. So my system has to change. So the new now is about uniting, setting expectations and operating while the new future simultaneously happens was about reactivating growth and making the change systematically so that the company resilience is at an all time high on the other side of this. So <clears throat> if you asked you at, in our last call, you mentioned GM <laughs> with Mary Barry was talking about, um, if you asked her six months ago, would she be building a factory of ventilators, ventilators or she'd say, 
that would take us a year to develop or two years to reach Wolf Factory. And they did it in weeks, right? Now, the political circumstances of that were difficult, but the point is they learned that they could move fast. They were durable. And yeah. now that the, the great reset has happened, I think you have the permission to look at the company through a different set of lenses. Not because of its possibility, but because the demand will reveal the resiliency. Yeah. And once that, it's, it's, it's a gift because once you realize that you can move fast when old truths are no longer worth preserving, then you have the ability to rediscover that, that resilience because you are granting the permission. Mm -hmm. And that's the moral authority that we have right now is to actually go do it. And so the, to lower the cost of failure by permission, but also lower cost of failure because those systems are no longer worth it, now we create the ability to get to truth faster. And that is the moment I think we're in as a leader that creates a new resiliency going forward.